Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us yet another night uh, to come together in the safety and warmth of this building. And thank you so much for sending your spirit to lead us and guide us and anoint us with wisdom. As we open up your word tonight to study what, hope, what I hope is a very exciting series of, uh, of messages and, and pieces of information, I pray more than the excitement that you will draw us nearer to yourself, that every one of us can go home knowing Jesus Christ better and having made fuller and more solid commitments to him. And I ask in his name, amen. When we are done, I have these little books, but I have a finite number of them. They are decoding the mark of the beast. We're going to talk a little bit about the mark of the beast today, but not a lot. So this will go into greater detail than the message will. And I want to give one to everybody, but I will appeal to the seasoned, prophetically seasoned church members that if you kind of think you know your way around the mark of the beast already, maybe you leave this for someone else, okay? Just so we can all have the, the information that we need. <clears throat> all right, so here we go. So far in the great hope, we have seen how the Bible tells us about a planet Earth that is, was very, very, very different than the world in which we live now. And it was a planet of life and abundance where sickness and evil and death and all of the horrible things we live with regularly were just foreign concepts. They were alien. They weren't even foreign. They didn't exist. <laughs> they didn't exist at all, not even in the minds of the people there. But just as we learned that peace had already been broken elsewhere in the universe by a rogue angel, and the name we're given in scripture is Lucifer, the light bearer, so too was the peace broken here on earth by that same rogue angel, Lucifer, now carrying around the name Satan, the adversary in the, uh, in the Hebrew. <clears throat> means accuser in Greek. And that's kind of funny that the same name means different things in different languages. But at least in the Old Testament, he's the adversary. There's theology to that too, right? Because he can't really be the adversary in the New Testament era because he's already been defeated. So now the best he can do is accuse us and remind us of our sin over and over again. Anyway, so last night, we also saw how God was not content to leave the world in that fallen condition where the creatures made in his own image would get sick and decrepit and die. And God said, no, that's not what I did. That's not what I made this for, and it's not going to stay that way forever. So God himself would become a man in the person of Jesus Christ. He would absorb all of the sin of the world and then die on the cross, the death that we all deserve in exchange so that we could take the life that he deserves instead. It's an amazing divine substitute. And I pray that every one of us went home last night having made that choice to give our broken lives to Jesus in exchange for his perfect life from today onward. Amen. We saw that this was an eternal promise given before Adam and Eve were even ejected out of the Garden of Eden. Chapter 3, verse 21. Right? Before they even had been kicked out, they got this promise which means the religion of the promised Messiah is the oldest religion on planet Earth. Amen, indeed. Amen, indeed. And because of the sacrifice that Messiah would one day make on man's behalf, mankind would be free to one day regain his place, our place in the family of God if only we would be willing to accept the sacrifice of the Messiah. Once we do that, we are to submit to it, be changed by it, be cleansed from sin, and live new lives onward into eternity. Amen? It's a beautiful gospel promise. And you would think 
since all the work is done by Jesus and all we have to do is say yes, you would think it would be so easy, everybody would do it, right? Even in the Old Testament, when it was a little bit harder, you had to go get the animal and do all this stuff. But even then, you would think the promise is so great, everybody would do it. And yet, unfortunately, we see in the pages of Scripture that this righteousness by faith in a coming Messiah persisted for less than one generation before it all fell apart. So tonight we're going to see how the one sin in the Garden of Eden spread all the way across the world in our message tonight called People of the Mark. Hmm. Hmm. So we'll start in Genesis 4, and we're going to spend a good amount of time in Genesis 4 if you want to follow along. Genesis 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and I assume we all know what that means, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So you see a lot of time passes in these couple verses. They go from not even conceived yet to kind of all the way grown-ups doing grown-up stuff with the land and the animals. Cain is the elder of these, of these men. He was, a, uh, he was a farmer, a grower of, of plants. Abel was his younger brother and is said to be a shepherd or a rancher of some sort, working with the animals. Now these are important jobs. Even today, these are important jobs, but certainly all the way back then when there was no Save Mart down the street to go get your groceries. These men don't do their job and nobody eats. Very important jobs. Verse 3 and onward. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. All right, so the, we need to recognize that both of these men knew they were supposed to bring some sort of offering to God. Okay? That means they had instruction. They had been taught by their parents, Adam and Eve. They had a knowledge of the promised coming Messiah. And they knew, at least intellectually, the fallen condition of the world. I mean, they lived it, right? So they knew it. But they never lived in a perfect world. So they kind of only kind of knew it in their minds that it was not the way it was supposed to be. And yet we see a problem here. They're both coming from the same place, and yet God accepts only one of these men's offerings. And we have to ask ourselves, why? See, both of them brought the fruits of their labor, plants and vegetables from Cain the farmer, and a slain animal from Abel the rancher, or the shepherd. So they're both bringing in their minds the same thing, what they both worked to produce. But what did we learn yesterday about those sacrifices? What did they represent? Jesus Christ. A coming Messiah who was to die in place of the sinner. And so the offering that represents the Messiah who's coming to die has to, in and of itself, die. <laughs> we, and not only that, but in a specific manner. As we're told in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The blood is where the sin is, symbolically speaking. And so the offering must die in a manner that sheds its blood. And if that criterion is not met, it simply cannot represent Jesus Messiah. Okay? So when Cain brought a plate of vegetables, what did his offering represent? What did it not represent? Did not represent Messiah, not the Christ. Ultimately, it represented himself, his own ideas, his own works. Now, proper faith, okay, 
righteousness by faith. The gospel level faith is, I'm about to define it for you, ready? It's believing what God says, even if you don't understand it. That's tough for some people, but think about it. In the garden, did Eve fully understand that eating of the fruit was wrong? Careful, that might be a trick question. Did she fully understand it? I don't think so either, brother. Because if she fully understood the horror it would bring, she wouldn't have done it, right? She got tricked. Now, did her lack of full awareness of how wrong it was make it any less wrong? There you go. Righteousness by faith is believing what God says, even if you don't fully understand it. Okay? That is the righteousness, or that is the faith that leads to righteousness and the faith that leads to life. So, righteousness by faith is claiming God's righteousness as our own, because that's what God says. I take your death so that you take my life. And we say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But God said it, so we believe it. It means taking God's righteousness as our own by faith. And what that means ultimately is obedience. By faith. Cain and Abel were to bring blood sacrifices simply because God said so. There was no other reason. God said so. So when Cain brought an improper offering anyway, this was simply not righteousness by faith. It was, in fact, quite the opposite of that. It was Cain's attempt to claim the righteousness of the coming Messiah but doing so in his own way, not the way that God prescribed. He didn't care about God's prescription for righteousness. He brought a plate of produce because that didn't require any extra effort on his part. He already had it from his day's worth of labor. And so Abel brought his faith represented through his obedience. Cain brought his works represented by his disobedience. And so as early as Genesis chapter 4 here, we already see a distinction between God's people and the devil's people. God's people are obedient people. The devil's people, like the devil himself, they like to make up their own rules. Hmm. So, righteousness by works... Is making up your own rules in contrast to what God plainly says. It's the very definition of righteousness by works. When you desire to gain the blessings of God without any obedience toward God, in that moment you decide that God's way is not as important as your own way. You say, hey, Jesus, I know better than you. <laughs> Because I know what you're saying, but this way's my, my way's better. My way's superior. My way's more fun. <laughs> In this paradigm, your faith may be strong enough to believe that Jesus is who he was, is who he is, did what he did. But that same faith may not be quite strong enough to live or to worship in the way that he asks you to. See, and this is what we're going to really dive into today. There are varying levels of faith. And I hope that makes sense to us because you know who believes that Jesus is the Son of God better than anyone else in the universe? The enemy. Satan. That's right. And is Satan going to live forever in God's kingdom? No. no. So clearly it requires something more than an intellectual agreement with who Jesus is. It requires something deeper than that. So the Bible says that Cain was upset that his offering was not accepted. And that means he was a believer. You know, if he didn't believe in God, then who cares what God does, right? But he thought that he would get a favorable response. And when he did not, that made him upset. He desired the righteousness of God. Just not enough to do what God asked. But now God is so good he doesn't give up on Cain, even though 
Cain is going sideways here. God pursued Cain in his rebellion as he always does. Just like he pursued Adam in the garden and investigated what had gone wrong. Just as he gave Adam the chance to repent before he passed judgment upon him, he does the exact same thing for Cain. Verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And you know, friends, as a side note, that little last sentence by God there is so profound. And how many preachers have you heard in your life who reframe that idea as, if you do not do well, you're going to go straight to hell? <laughs> you know? And that's where they leave it. Like, do what I say and you'll live forever. And do the opposite of what I say and you'll burn in hell. You know? But this is not what God is saying. If you do well, you'll be accepted. If you don't do well, there's an enemy that will use the fact that you're not doing well to come and get you. Just, hey, if you don't do the right thing, you'll be weaker and you won't be able to stand up against the enemy. God doesn't desire that anybody should die. Amen? Anyway, that's a profound statement by God there. So here comes God, virtually begging Cain to repent and to do the right thing. He's telling Cain the way back to standing rightly with God and explaining the consequences as to what will happen if he does not. That is the same exact paradigm that every one of us here faces. God is holding open the door to righteousness, saying, hey guys, come on. But he won't force you through it. He hung over there on a cross on a hill as an open invitation for everybody who desires to come and be part of what he was doing. But sin is just as desiring of you now as it was of Cain back then, should we walk out of the graces of God. Right? That enemy is still alive and well, and it still wants the worst for us. So, that's the choice that Cain had, and what did he do with it? Verse 8. This verse, I like to believe that as Cain talked with Abel, his brother, that he did so with the intention of reconciliation. The Bible doesn't say that, but, but I like to give Cain the benefit of the doubt here, that he's going there to make right. But... The communication apparently broke down, as it so often does here in the world, and it came to pass, when they were in the field together, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. That means the very first person born on planet Earth was a murderer. And it doesn't seem like we've gone a whole lot farther than that paradigm today, does it? I'd like you to consider the horror that must have welled up inside of Cain after he struck that fatal blow against his brother. See him in your mind's eye, maybe crouch next to Abel's body, nudging him. I mean, remember, he'd never seen a human die before. No one ever had. Right? Maybe he's kind of lightly slapping his face. Hey, man, wake up, wake up. Come on, we got to go home. Imagine the tightening of his chest when he's trying to rouse his brother, turns his head over and sees that giant gaping wound in his head. Imagine the horror as the realization sinks in that he had just done to his brother what they had together done to so many lambs as they had grown up. And with the same result that Abel was now no longer moving. Try to get inside of Cain's head as he wonders what to say to Adam and Eve. How would he explain this? Did he have any words for anger even? Or jealousy? Or rage? Or pride? Was he scared that his parents would do to him as he had just done to Abel? Well, in any case, God intervened on him before he had a chance to take any specific action. Again, right? Because God never gives up. 
He comes to investigate what's going on and to offer Cain another chance at repentance. Verse 9. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, if Cain was under any delusions that lying to God would work, God corrects his understanding right away. Verse 10. And God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And so Cain's curse is worse than Adam's curse. You may remember yesterday, Adam was cursed to work the ground for sustenance, to survive. He couldn't just pick stuff off the trees and live forever anymore, right? Now he had to work for it and toil with the ground. But he would still, you know, get some food out of it. Whereas Cain has promised that he would not. He'd work and he'd work and he'd work and the ground would give him nothing in return. So his days of farming are over. <sighs> Try as he may, he simply would not succeed. So therefore, he now has to go wherever there is food. He says he can't produce any more. He has to go get what is lying around. He has to live a nomadic life now. And nobody, nobody was going to change this paradigm for him. Since he could no longer grow food, if there was no food to be found, as, I mean, there often is not, just you walk through a forest, how many edible plants do you find there? What does he do if he can't grow food and he's in a place where there is no food to eat? Where do you get food? Yeah, but there were no cities. There were only three living human beings on the, well, three plus. We're about to meet Cain's sister in a minute here. So four living human beings in the world. There are no cities. <laughs> where do you go? What do you do? Go back to the parents. Yeah, but that's not an option for him. Uh, also, you're thinking too hard. What do you do when there's no plant food to eat? What do you eat instead? Yeah. Yep. And we see here the implication of the first carnivorous diet on planet Earth. You know it wasn't too long before he gets hungry enough that he starts wondering what that deer over there tastes like. <laughs> Cain realizes that he can't live in his own life anymore. Everything has to change. His cursed farming abilities would result in no food for him, but also no food for his parents. So even if they were willing to accept him, he's going to be a burden on their household now. Cain begs God for another way. This is too horrible for him. Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Does that sound like repentance to you? Careful, that's another trick question. <laughs> that's a false repentance. It looks like repentance, but really, what he's doing is repenting of his punishment. He shunned God's offer to repent two times when he could have, in theory, gotten out of this in a much easier way, but he didn't take that opportunity twice in a row. And yet now, he is quick to go straight to repentance as soon as he is faced with the consequences of his actions. But that doesn't count in the sight of God. Repenting of the consequences is not the same as repenting of the action itself. Because, and I hope this makes sense to you, if the only reason you are sorry is because you don't like the fallout, that means you're not really sorry. That means you'd go ahead and do it again if the outcome was better. Sorry you got 
Sorry you got caught, right? But not sorry you did the thing. So that's not what God wants from us. He wants genuine repentance that we went down a wrong road so that we can course correct and go down the right road instead. Cain isn't interested in that. He just doesn't want to live with the curse. How much better would it have gone for Cain if he'd have gone to the Lord and said, God, I'm so sorry. My heart is clouded with sin. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm so angry. I'm so jealous. My younger brother, <laughs> the, 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 the kid I used to change his diapers, whatever diapers used to look like back then, right? I used to, this little baby is telling me what to do, telling me how to be righteous. How does he get off? I'm so sorry. Just, Lord, he just made me so angry. I saw red in my eyes. I acted without thinking. I'm so sorry. Forgive me, please. You think it would have ended better? I think so too. But that's not what he did. And accordingly, now the life of a nomad would be his life. But God is so merciful. Here he comes again. <laughs> Even after having to pronounce a curse upon him, he now comes to calm Cain down. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. That's peace through strength, right? <laughs> you notice he doesn't promise nobody will kill Cain. He just makes the consequences of doing so severe enough that in theory, nobody will. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Okay, there's the mark. From which we get the title, the people of the mark. Now, what was this mark? We can gather some clues since the Bible doesn't tell us specifically, but from what we have studied and read already, we know the following. It came as a result of righteousness by works or disobedience, excuse me, disobedience to the plain things of God. It came after Cain had an opportunity to repent, but did not. It afforded him a certain measure of safety while on the earth. And then presumably, even though the Bible doesn't say this directly, but presumably since, since he did not take that opportunity to repent, presumably it came at the expense of his eternal life. Okay? So it happened because he spurned the gospel and doing so helped him to live safely on earth, but forbade him from living forever in God's kingdom. So it's actually kind of attractive, right? If all we have is an earthly perspective and we do not put our minds and our hearts on eternity, well then have mercy. Isn't this exactly what we want? Yeah, Lord, do to me whatever is necessary to give me a safe and prosperous life on earth. Hallelujah. And we only realize how horrible that is if we stop to realize like, oh, wait, that means I can't live forever. It's pretty important where you put your heart, isn't it? Now, we are about to see how this mark affected the spread of humanity across the globe. But first, I want to show you how it affects us today because it informs us of the future as well. In Revelation chapters 13 and 14, we see a very similar mark. It is called the mark of the beast. And there are three messages in Revelation chapter 14 that are said to come from God to the world immediately prior to the return of Jesus Christ. The first one of which we have looked at for two nights in a row, that, that first angel's message that concludes by saying, worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the, the springs of water. Well, the third of those three messages starts in chapter 14, verse 9. And it very plainly says that those who receive the mark of the beast will not inherit immortality. They simply will not. They will not be with God forever. They will not live in God's kingdom. The infamous mark of the beast is the worst 
thing that can happen to you, biblically speaking. There's nothing worse than that. And this is the mark that is associated with the mysterious and spooky number 666. I've legit known people in life who get a credit card that ends with 666 and they cut it up and cancel the account. They're so worried about that number. <laughs> people are scared of that number. Because we're only together for one week right now, we're not going to have time to really dig into what that number means. But if you like these things and you want to keep going in the future, maybe in the new year, we can resume where we leave off, then we will, in fact, go into pretty solid detail about 666 if you're interested, future tense, right? But I promise you, I, you know, I, I can't promise promise because I'm not a prophet, but I can just about promise that if you give me the opportunity in the future to go through the rest of these meetings, every single person here will learn something new about the mark of the beast. <laughs> I know that's a big claim. Some of you have been doing this for a long, long time, but there's a whole lot wrapped up in that number, and I would love the chance to go through it with you. Anyway, okay, back to tonight's message. <clears throat> the mark of the beast is ultimately the same as the mark of Cain. If we were to study out Revelation 13, we would see that the mark of the beast also comes as a result of disobedience toward God. It comes after we are given an opportunity to repent, but do not. And that's the first angel's message, right? Bringing the everlasting gospel to everybody on the earth, saying, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him the right way like he says. And we hear that message and we say, yeah, you know, I like my version of God better. <laughs> well, we had an opportunity to repent and we did not. And we inherit the mark of the beast as a result. Receiving that mark, according to Revelation chapter 13, affords us some safety in the world. In fact, without the mark, we are social outcasts. Our money doesn't buy anything and you go hungry, right? But as we just read in that third angel's message, it very clearly comes at the expense of eternal life. So it's the exact same thing. The exact same mark for the exact same reasons with the exact same result. By the way, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I mean, I, th there's a reason that I go kind of painstakingly through these early books. I think it's gorgeous that God put the seeds of the end sprinkled all the way through the beginning. <laughs> it's like the story never changes because the author at the end wrote down the beginning with the end in mind. Hallelujah. All right. So, I would like all of this to be a study tool for you. More than 85% of the book of Revelation, and I think that's a conservative number, I think it's well over 90, but more than 85% of Revelation is either direct allusions to or direct quotes from the Old Testament. What we do is we take the meaning of the story or the passage referenced in the Old Testament, and we drag it into the prophecy in the New Testament. And by doing that, we can, like, we can super load a ton of information into what we're reading with just a very few words. So this is a study tool. It helps us to decode Revelation the right way. And I believe, actually, Revelation cannot be understood without this this study tool. We can also understand that the conflict at the end of time is the same as the conflict at the beginning of time. It's the same thing. In fact, all of human history is one great big spiritual lesson on endless repeat over and over and over and over again, because God never changes, but neither does the devil which means the war between them is always the same. The details of the devil's deceptions change, but the deceptions themselves are always the same. It's worthwhile to get to know the devil in that way because you can kind of anticipate what he's going to do because he always does the same thing. Therefore, if your churches 
or your novels or the movie you like, if whatever you're consuming about the end of time, if those ideas seem totally off kilter to the rest of the Bible, the beginning of the Bible, like it doesn't fit with the foundational stuff, then guess what? That means what you're listening to is wrong. Hate to make it so plain, but it's true. You can say an infinite number of incorrect things about God. You can say a much smaller number of correct things about God. Amen? Right? There's only one correct answer to 2 plus 2. two, plus two. There's an infinite number of incorrect answers, but there's only one correct one. So we want to make sure that we get the correct answers about God. And finally, I hope this will help us understand, as it did for me, that we are living just in the exact same world that those early chapters describe. It didn't seem that way to me. You know, reading about like two brothers, a shepherd and a farmer in a world where God speaks to them out of the air and I'm living in New York City <laughs> with 13 million other people seemed like a to totally different world. But you study it down into here and you realize it really is the same world. And I hope we can more easily come to that conclusion. All right. Let's go back to Genesis 4. Cain's issue was not an issue of unbelief. Let me say that again. It was not an issue of disbelief, right? He was not an atheist. He believed in God. He just didn't believe God, if that makes sense, right? He fully knew that God was real. He just didn't really want to believe what God said as true. Right? God said, bring me an animal sacrifice to prophesy the promised Messiah. And Cain heard, eh, bring whatever you want. I just want you to worship me however you think is best. <laughs> wow, does that sound like a lot of modern day churches? <laughs> sure does. Yep. Cain was interested in a form of godliness, but not with any of the responsibilities required by God. And so he was banished, according to Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. He was banished from the presence of the Lord and went to live in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. What a sad legacy. Rather than repent and be obedient, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Let the records of heaven show none of us departing from the presence of the Lord. Amen. I was hoping for a little bit of a louder amen on that church. Got my eye on you guys here. All right. In the very next verse, we meet Cain's wife. Verse 17. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. Now, not a trick question. Who is this woman and where does she come from? Say again, louder. Yeah, that's his sister. That's correct. There's only one family on earth at that time. So it must have been his sister. And in chapter 5, we do learn that Adam and Eve had daughters as well. So it is Cain's sister wife. <laughs> because that would have been required and common in those early generations. It says they built a city. And what does that mean? Cain, wife, and child is three. Is that a city? Probably not. But think about it. These people lived a long time, hundreds of years, according to these early chapters. How many babies can you pop out if you have a fertility cycle that lasts 500 years? <laughs> uh, yeah, you can see how a city, a legit city would form after not too long, right? By the time you're done having children, your oldest children are having children of their own. You know, you can easily see how a city would come out of that paradigm. But would Cain have raised his children with a knowledge of God? A proper knowledge of God? Of course not. No. He had departed from God. So, of course, if he passes on anything, it's going to be improper, incomplete. In verse 18, we see that Cain bred more rebels in his own image. The man of the mark 
became the people of the mark. And thus, Cain becomes the original seed of the devil, the seed of the serpent. As the chapter continues, we learn that it was the people of the mark who introduced polygamy into the world, two wives. <laughs> and then in verses 20 through 22, they also gave us ranching and music and metalworking. <laughs> Which one does not belong? Polygamy, <laughs> metalworking, music, raising animals. <laughs> Which of those things seems out of place? The polygamy, yeah, right? Because polygamy, we all agree that's pretty evil, right? That's some sort of departure from the things of God. But all those other things seem pretty normal, don't they? And what we can understand here is that Satan's representatives on earth don't always seem that bad. They don't walk around killing people all the time. They play music. They build things. They raise livestock. They also happen to murder and lie and marry two wives and etc. But, you know, they do these normal things too. And the mark of Cain is the same as the mark of the beast. So those with the mark of the beast are also going to appear to do totally normal things. We begin to understand why Jesus says, no, you've got to let the wheat and the tares grow together because only I can tell them apart. <laughs> you guys can't tell them apart. So what makes a satanic thing satanic if it's not open sin? Verse 24. Lamech, a descendant of Cain's, pronounces a greater set of protection upon himself than God pronounced upon Cain. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then I, Lamech, seventy-sevenfold. That is satanic. Because what Lamech did was he took something of God's, misapplied it in a way that God never intended, in the name of God. That is Satanism. And that is what we will see at the end of time. It's not open like serial murdering and prostitution and etc. No, these are people who will have Jesus on their lips. Revelation 13 is clear. The whole thing is, is worshipful. They will appear to be Christians. They will say and do good things. The problem is they take the things of God and do violence to them. And they misapply the things of God in a way that God never intended. Well, where should we go from there? God did not leave the world to suffer in this way all by itself. It's not like the people of the mark just came greater and greater and more and more and more and more, and there was no check upon them. Quite the opposite. If we read on from this satanic declaration of Lamex, we see that Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. There's the new Cain, Cain 2.0. And Seth now creates a lineage of godliness that ultimately stretches down to Noah. And then Noah and his family survive the flood. So, <clears throat> Cain represents the lineage of Satan's people. Seth represents the lineage of God's people. And even though Seth and his family appear to be the minority population, and so you can just only imagine how hard it would have been to live in that world, nonetheless, there have always been a faithful people on the planet. Even in the darkest times, there have been a faithful people on the planet. And that is really important to recognize because this war, this war is still ongoing eternally. 
Satan accused God of being too strict, uncompassionate, restrictive of the very freedom that he claimed to give to his creatures. And so counter that claim, God allows the rebellion of sin to run its natural course. And the intervention of Jesus Christ was the definitive check on the authority of sin, ultimately. But before we could do that, God first had to prove to us and to the entire watching universe what would happen when God takes his hand of protection away. In other words, what happens to the image of God when it exists separately from God himself? And the world at large demonstrated clearly what happens to even the most noble of creatures, the living images of God, who live without the sanctifying influence of the almighty God. The world before the flood serves as a demonstration as to why death is necessary for sinners. It's like a microcosmic example of what would have happened if God permitted there to be immortal sinners. These people lived almost a thousand years at a pop. And the pre-flood world is said to only exist for about 1,600 years. So that's only, that's less than two complete generations and the world goes from perfection to completely devastatingly degenerate and needing to be destroyed. And that's what, that's what is the nature of sin. That's why we can't play with it. Amen? It's not a toy. It will destroy. So that is how civilization began. That's how the world became what it is. We, for the last three nights, we have walked through how it fell from perfection to what we live in now. And we see the spread of evil ultimately because I take liberty with the things of God. Well, wouldn't you know it, as the Bible shows us how civilization began, it also shows us how civilization will come to an end. It's, it's bookended nicely in that way. Did you know there is a countdown to, to eternity? It's actually several of them, but there is a prophetic countdown to eternity. I believe it stands as proof that God is who he is. Now, you may know what I'm talking about already if you're familiar with this, but if you're not, it takes the form of a statue. And it was given by God in a dream in the year 605 BC to a pagan king who believed that he was the rightful king over the entire world. So God had to explain differently to this man. So long story short, this king has a dream and he requires some help from God's people to understand what the dream was. And so a prophet named Daniel comes to the rescue here and tells the king what he dreamed and what it means. And because we only have about 20 minutes or so, I am not going to give you the hour long version of this. So my disclaimer is, if this is interesting to you and you want to know more, um, we could easily spend an hour on this. I'm really just giving you the, the, the highlights and the nuggets for today to help you understand how close we are to the return of Jesus, okay? Uh, if you're super interested, we actually just had a class on this chapter not so long ago. It's on our YouTube page, so you can check out a whole hour-long presentation from a position of literary analysis and all that stuff. So it's there for you if you want to learn more. But here is the content of the dream that God gave to this king. Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 31. You, king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. 
The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So there's the dream, okay? The king dreamed of a statue, probably looks something like that, made of four different metals, with clay mixed into the fourth metal in the feet portion of the statue. The dream ends with a supernatural rock descending out of the sky and smashing the the statue on its feet, which then shatters into pieces and blows away as if it never existed. That rock then grows and grows until it encompasses the entirety of the earth. That's the dream. And from there, the Bible continues the very next verse to interpret that dream for us. I just point that out so you know I'm not making it up, right? The Bible is the best interpreter of itself. And in this particular case, you don't even have to turn the page. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Verse 37. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So here we're told quite plainly that the head of gold in this statue represents this king who is Nebuchadnezzar, famous historical name. He ruled ancient Babylon during its peak in the 500s BC. Babylon was in modern day Iraq, about 60 miles away from the capital city of Baghdad today, in case you want to find it on a map. It has been desolate ever since the time of Alexander the Great, just as the Bible promised it would be, but that's a different Bible study. Anyway, continues, verse 39. But after you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So this verse here broadens the meaning of the metals to cover the entire kingdom, not just the ruler. Okay, it's not just Nebuchadnezzar, it's all of Babylon. So the chest and arms of silver represent the kingdom that succeeds Babylon, and then The bronze represents the third kingdom that takes over after the second one. It's an orderly progression of history, told in symbolic form. Do you see that? Verse 40. And then the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all of the others. There's a promise there will be a fourth kingdom, the third one after Babylon. It will escalate its brutality somehow, stronger and more cruel than the previous. Verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, that fourth kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Now suddenly things change. The progression of kingdoms is broken here. Okay? Because no one comes to power after the fourth kingdom. No one conquers it. The Bible says it will be divided. It will fall apart. And yet it will retain its original strength, even in, in its divided form. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. So this fourth kingdom, after it breaks apart, will be both strong and weak somehow, simultaneously. And its pieces will try to squish themselves together, but it will never work. And it will never actually result in a unified kingdom. God promises that fourth kingdom will be divided forever. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Hallelujah. 
During the time of the divided fourth kingdom, God will do something that is described here as setting up a kingdom. Now, if time permitted, we would know exactly what that means over the next several weeks of these kinds of messages. Maybe, as I'm suggesting, if we kind of pick this up in the new year or at a, some time in the future, then we can explore this to some considerable detail. But God will set up his kingdom at a specific point in time, not progressively, endlessly, all throughout time, at a specific moment in time. And then verse 45, In as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. All right, so the Bible itself in Daniel 2 here does not give us the specifics of any of these kingdoms, although it does later on in chapter 8, but not here. But it does give us a specific flow of human history. And if we consult our history books and we learn that history did not turn out this way, then we would have free license to disregard this prophecy as, as bunk and by extension, the entire rest of the Bible. So that's a pretty high standard, right? It will turn out this way, like God said, or else we have permission to throw away the Bible and ignore it entirely. Whoa, that's quite a test. But history did turn out that way. <laughs> yes, it did. And it's not over yet. And so here's how it worked. Babylon ruled the known world from 608 B.C. until 539 B.C. But it was conquered by Cyrus the Persian, and then Medo-Persia ruled the known world from 539 B.C. until 330 B.C., at which time, near Medo-Persia's decline, a different nation began to ascend to power under the military leadership of Alexander the Great which means Greece succeeded after Medo-Persia and ruled the known world from 330 BC until roughly 168 BC. I say roughly because it kind of happened in chunks. You know, Greece didn't fall all at once, but 168 is a good date to give. The Greeks were eventually overpowered by their neighbors across the Aegean Sea, the Romans, and the Iron Monarchy of Rome became the Iron Empire of Rome. Rome then ruled the known world from 168 BC until 476. 476, is that right? 476 AD. I think it's 476. My notes say 478, but I think that's a mistake. Anyway, it's one of those two dates. <laughs> In the 470s AD. That was a long time. Greece was, or I'm sorry, Rome was in power a long time. Who conquered Rome? Nobody. Nobody conquered Rome. Just as no metal follows the iron in the prophecy. Rome fell to its own excesses. And we learn of 10 people groups who emerged from this ruined empire and where they went after Rome collapsed. And it goes something like this. It was from the ruins of Rome that modern Europe was born. The various people groups settled in various parts of the continent and then over time developed into the nations that we know today. And the easiest example from this list is the Franc people who settled in what later became known as France. Ten major tribes emerged from Rome, just like the ten toes that were on the feet of the statue. And we know that the various you know, royalty uh, of these leaders of these countries, they have tried all sorts of stuff to squish themselves together, to negotiate, to intermarry, to go to war and conquer each other. And now today, in the 20th and 21st century, we're trying to kind of buy each other into allegiance with money. You know, glue them all together back with the euro, a common currency. But nothing has ever worked. 
All throughout time, nothing has ever worked, and God promises nothing ever will work. Therefore, here's a practical conclusion. While the rest of the world, a few years ago, when Britain voted to exit the European Union and the whole world went crazy, see, those of us who knew prophecy, we looked at it and said, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron does not mix with clay. So, by the way, you think the rest of the EU will stick together? I don't think so. We'll have to see what happens, but God promised it would not cleave together. So, modern-day Rome, which is better known as Europe, is prophetically guaranteed to forever remain split. But it's said to have that strength of, of the iron still in it. Well, of course, the kingdom of Europe is responsible for sparking the two greatest and, and most breathtakingly awful, horrific wars ever known to mankind. In fact, there's really one country in the kingdom of Europe that was responsible for both of those wars. You know, and then today, even today, their collective economy stands on the perpetual brink of collapse. All sorts of mayhem comes out of that continent. But the Bible did say it was during that time that God would set up his kingdom. And we would know all about that if, we, if you permit these meetings to continue on at some point in the future. So, critics of the Bible can't refute any of this. They can't do it. The best they can do is suggest that Daniel chapter 2 was written in the 200s BC instead of the 500s BC, which it claims. Now, I don't think that's true, but even if it is, it doesn't change the prophecy. It's, it still perfectly outlines more than a millennium of time. And as far as I'm concerned, it is proof that God is real. Right? Um, John chapter 14, verse 29, Jesus says, Behold, I have told you ahead of time, so that when you see it come to pass, you may believe. Prophecy is to make us believe. The last detail was that supernatural rock that shatters all the metals and then encompasses the earth. And friends, that's Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, identifies God as the rock. Psalm 18, verse 2, same thing. God is my rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, that rock was Christ. Do you see the hope in this? Friends, that means that no matter how dark and crazy the world gets around us, this prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 stands as a witness that God is in control the deliverance is coming soon. And I mean soon. You realize we're in the toes of that statue, right? Europe has been divided for a long time now. And we are hanging off the toenails of that statue. There's no more statue left. There's no more prophecy left. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. 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 Well... As we continue to learn for the rest of the week, what we need to keep in mind, I know I threw a lot at you tonight in these past few nights, but let's keep in mind always that the conflicts in the world today and the greater conflicts that are still promised to come are none other than the final end results, the natural conclusions of the conflicts that began with the mark of Cain. The whole world is just the reaction to Genesis chapter 4. Well, last night we saw how Jesus took upon himself every attribute of darkness so that he could impart to us every attribute of life. So therefore, to anyone who is here tonight or watching on the internet, and you look back on your life, and you think, I have been doing it my way for too long. Lord, I've been a person of the mark. 
playing fast and loose with your things. If you realize you've been going down the wrong road, friends, I got some good news for you tonight. Because Jesus Christ has a mark for you too. So you don't need to be marked by Cain or the beast. God has a seal he wants to put on you instead. Our last scripture of the evening, Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And by the time Jesus returns, the Bible says all people alive on earth will have received one or the other of these marks, either Cain and the beast or the seal of God. Let's resolve today right now to strive for that seal of God. Not that we can earn it, but to seek after God always and allow him to seal us with that mark instead of allowing the beast to seal us with his mark instead. Let us decide tonight we're not going to be the people of the mark anymore. Amen? We'll be the people of God. Do you desire the seal of God in your lives today, friends? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for showing us how civilization began and how it's going to come to an end. Thank you for helping us to understand how close we are to the return of Jesus Christ. And I pray that that will put some urgency inside of us when we look at our lives and we realize that they're not right, that we have things that are wrong. We have maybe been a person of the mark in certain ways, even as we're faithful in other ways. But Father, that's not good enough. And we don't want that to be good enough. We repent of all the things we have claimed unto ourselves when they belong rightly to you. Give us the gift of repentance, Father, so we can let go of all of that, release it into your hands, and allow you to show us what life should be like. Father, seal us with your seal and disallow us from going anywhere near that mark of the beast in these last days. Show us how to respond to your invitations of repentance and give us grace enough to follow obediently and faithfully in your example and your footsteps. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray that you will remember each and every one of our names on that great day that I believe is coming soon when you will call us to meet you in the air. Keep us safe now as we part ways tonight and bring us back tomorrow, I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.